Hello, everybody. Ah, comfortable seat. Thank you for joining us uh, for this topic. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, uh, easily right now one of the more recognizable faces in our state. Uh, I'm not going out too far on a limb when I guess that in not too many years he will be one of the more recognizable faces in our country politically. Am I going to do something wrong? I don't know, but uh, on the way, I hope you hire me when you do it. Um, not only, not only a, a risk taker politically, but who also knows a lot about technology. And that leads us to uh, today's topic and, and the topic of uh, his new book, Citizenville. Uh, if there is anything, uh, and I've covered tech for 19 years, if there's anything that is desperately in need of disruption, it is government, if I may say. <laughs> and, uh, Amen. And, and I wonder, when you see uh, an issue, whether it's net neutrality or any sort of hearing uh, in, in Congress uh, that has anything to do with technology, do you, not only as a technologist but a politician, cringe at how far behind our government typically is when it comes to understanding this? Well, stuff? yeah, I mean, we are on the leading cutting edge of 1973. <laughs> um, and, and I say that literally. I mean, the DMV, we all love our DMV, uh, just went through a procurement process with HP to put a $208 million upgrade. We spent about $135 million bucks, and we abandoned the project. The head of the DMV made the point that this is 40-year-old plumbing at the DMV. We put little fancy websites on top of the plumbing. Dangerously antiquated technology that could collapse at any time was precisely what he said 12 months ago. Uh, and it mirrors that example of what exists in almost every major agency in government. And this is in California, the tip of the spear in terms of its technological innovation. I was mayor of San Francisco. Uh, we are still at the police department trying to get email in all of the stations in the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, they're working off, literally, apparently, I didn't even know this technology existed. Uh, in the late 1960s, they've patched together this cobalt system. Uh, and there's apparently, I'm not lying to you, one of the overtime heroes every year, a guy who gets more overtime every year, and we go, who the hell is this guy, and can't we move him on? They say, no, he's the only guy that understands this system. Uh, we must preserve and protect him. <laughs> really, as a citizen, why is that? We've gotten to the point where, whether it's ordering flowers to ordering an Uber car, everything is instantly at our convenience because of technology, because yeah. of people like, you know, the people here that are starting companies, and yet we can't fix our gigantic institutions. So it's, it's a technological problem and it's a cultural problem. It's both. And one cannot short change the cultural framework. Uh, the problem is two problems. Procurement. We've got an IT cartel. I love my friends in technology, but they've got this game wired. There was a great study uh, that came out, or at least reflection on Obamacare site. Uh, and there's two, and one contradicts this slightly, but I'll give you the one. It said 46 out of the 47 major contractors on the healthcare site were long-term incumbents with the federal government. Been doing business with the federal government for decades. They're writing what they call these RFPs, RFQs, RFIs. Uh, they're helping actually write the process to which we would go through a very public, comprehensive, competitive process to determine what technology we procure. And it locks in the incumbents. And so what we're struggling is all these old legacy systems that we're patching together over decades and decades. And our inability just to remove that completely and go to the cloud. I mean, think about, now you say that and you go, Boy, that's not interesting. California is still debating a cloud-first policy for its technology. It's still debating it. We had a process last year we called CalCloud, and finally, we're going to be moving towards the cloud. We, we think maybe the cloud represents the future. Uh, even though there are dozens of states that have cloud-first policies going back over a decade, that's how the mindset how antiquated not just the technology is, but the mindset in terms of tech, technological uh, procurement and uh, the kind of improvement that we all, I think, seek. Even in the home state where the cloud not only was launched, but is a gazillion dollar industry. No, and I, when I, you know, my, my agency, the Lieutenant Governor's Office, I just broke the rules. I, I said, forget about it. We, I went to Benioff at Salesforce, San Francisco-based company, what he started, what, 1999 or something. Uh, and, uh, and Mark, we, we said, you know, how the hell do we just do this thing? We'll ask for forgiveness. Uh, and, uh, and we signed up. And uh, we were waiting for the mothership to come down on us. They never did. Um, and, you know, it's just an example of the, the, the struggle. But here's the, here's the problem. No one ever gets fired by going with incumbents. 
I mean, if you test new technology and it doesn't work out, uh, you're out of there. But boy, if you go with Big Blue or some old time, you're all set. You're not going to be fired. Uh, you know, and it's an extraordinary thing because the amount of money we waste makes all of the headlines you read about every single day pale in comparison. I just gave you the DMV example. $135 million just gone. $371 million. This is last year. I'm not making this up. $371 million upgrade to our payroll system. $254 million was spent, and we're suing the vendor because nothing's done. My CalPERS, 49 independent systems into one network, $228 million over budget, half a billion dollars spent. And the one that is the whopper of all, you cannot make this up, verify what I'm saying. You can look it up as I speak. We decided to take our court system, 58 counties, our court record system, 58 systems and connect it to one. In 2004, we identified a $260 million project that was going to be done in 2008. And about two years ago, someone said, hey, it's 2011. How the hell did that project work out? And they did a little report. It said, oh, well, it's not $260 million anymore. It's not 2008, obviously. It's not done. But we could get the project done, I kid you not, not for $360 million, even $860 million, but $1.9 billion. And we think we can get it done by 2015. We were wise enough to abandon that project as well. These aren't even headlines, because this is the norm. And this is a kind of waste of government. And I would argue corruption, not intentionally, but in terms of our mindset, that needs to give way to the reality that all of you are presenting and creating. This is really depressing, because yeah. it sounds almost, and you speak of the cultural, <laughs> sociological thing, that once you get to a certain level in government, you hit a brick wall of waste and, and antiquation. Is this why, for instance, when Barack Obama ran for president, yeah. he was hailed as, ah, the technology president, getting the word out on phones, texting everybody. And then once the health care that you mentioned kicked in, people couldn't even register on the web. So let's go back. You made the perfect point. We've all been conditioned by Amazon. And yet we're still standing in line at the DMV. And there are literally, not exaggerating, still forms in triplicate that exist in a lot of the DMVs. Now, that, that's a world, we're on a collision course with the future. You're not going to put up with it. You're downloading music songs. You're buying apps. You're, you know, you're designing your new Nike shoes. All online is just waiting there to get a DMV uh, reservation. And, and so you know, we need to wake up to this reality. It's one, it, it, is it any surprise people just don't buy it anymore? They don't care which side of the party on, this side, Democrat, Republican. I mean, you're not, I mean, sure, vote, but what real change is there? The system degeniuses everybody, right? For all the promotion, all the promise, they all seem to term out the same. And the example of Obama is profound, Scott. I mean, I'll never forget, I got inspired. Literally, the inspiration of the book was around the 2008 MyBarackObama.com, this notion of platform thinking. This guy gets it. Change, he says, starts from the bottom up. Yes, we can. 35,000 self-organizing communities came together, many in this room, I would, I'd imagine. An extraordinary two-way conversation. One-way conversations, they said, are dead. It's all about two-way conversations. And the president-elect in November, to his credit, said, I want to continue the conversation, and did something you may vaguely remember. This is also worth looking up to verify, because I won't make, I'm not making this up. Decided to shift the platform from MyBarackObama.com to Change.gov. And he had a very, very successfully attended town hall, virtually and physically, to talk about the priorities for the next, not just one term or even two terms, but for America into the future. And you could go to the website right now, it's static, change.gov, and you'll see the opening letter. Tell us what's on your mind. Is it the war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, the war on terror? Is it global climate change? Is it the issue of the financial meltdown? Remember, this is after Lehman Day 2015, uh, or September, after September 15, 2008. This is all the, the vestiges of that moment. What's on your mind? And American people came unprecedented numbers that day. And he sat there and opened up the virtual or physical envelope and said, American people, here's what is on your mind, the number one priority for not just the next four, eight years, but the next hundred years in terms of restoring our moral authority around the world for America. Drum roll, please. And he opened it up. Was it war on terror? Was it the financial meltdown? Was it pulling out of Afghanistan, Iraq? No, the number one priority that fateful day, not making this up, was legalize marijuana. 
<laughs> right. So one of you actually liked that, right? <laughs> you may have participated. And the, you may recall the president-elect did, in essence, what you just did, kind of laughed it off. One happy about that. They said, well, Mr. President-elect, you, you said you wanted a two-way conversation. You wanted feedback. And so what did they do? As I said, look it up. Change.gov went down for reconstruction. And they flipped the switch on it and converted it to whitehouse.gov, the old static whitehouse.gov. Someone wrote this. It's pretty hard hitting, so it's not my quote, but it summed it up. He says, the bottom up candidate that day became a top down president. Yes, we can, immediately was replaced with yes, he can. And therein lies the struggle. We're relatively good, Scott, I think, at using technology to amplify voices, to give people more choices, to come in and volunteer for us, to write checks, to show up on election day. But boy, once the election's over, we turn off those voices. Two-way conversation gives way to you vote, I decide. And the gig's up, particularly with millennials. You've been bathed in bit, digital natives. You're the participation generation. You don't want things done to you. You want things done with you. But government is still operating with an old machine mindset. Donald Kettle wrote about this uh, many years ago, brilliantly. He said, government is like a big vending machine. You put in your dollar taxes, and you get finite choices. Police, fire, health care, education, national defense. And if you don't like what you get, Donald said, you have the opportunity every two or four years to shake the machine, to kick it. And we're having a debate in this country, local level, state, and federal level, about the size of the machine, but it's still the machine thinking that's the problem versus the thinking that a guy named Steve brought to our attention, this notion of platform thinking, this idea that we don't have to provide all the apps, but government could be a convener, a coordinator, a collaborator. We could be big, as my friend Eric Lou says, on what, but small on how. Less prescriptive on how we deliver solutions, but absolutely committed to solving the big problems of ignorance, poverty, and disease. And so my whole framework is moving away from machine thinking to platform thinking, to move away from the old mindset of one-to-many mass education, mass distribution, mass communication, the old industrial mindset that clearly is run out of gas and run out of steam in the private sector that is only now being held out in large, top-down, hierarchical government institutions. We are on a collision course with the future. And aren't we noticing that a little faster each day because of Amazon, because of Uber, because of iTunes, we expect this convenient economy, and it works up to a point, but then we get to the DMV, or we get to the taxi line, or we get to anything that has to do with government, and again, we hit that brick wall. Well, I, you know, so I've been very informed by guys like Don Tapscott and, and Eric and Tom Freeman and all these guys that have been saying it more eloquently than I can ever say it. I mean, the bottom line is we move from a connected to a hyper-connected world. We move from an interconnected to an interdependent world. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you've heard Freeman say this. You should look it up. It's brilliant. He makes a point in his book, The World Has Talked About Globalization and Technology. He sold four and a half million copies. Probably two-thirds of you have a copy at home. In that book, which was on the New York Times bestseller in 2005, he started putting pen to paper in 04. He loves to make this point, to make the point of hyper-connectivity, not just connectivity. He says that book about technology and globalization, go back into the original copy, and you will see under index F, F, A, F, A, C, Facebook is not even there. He says when he wrote the book, The World is Flat, he says Facebook didn't exist, Twitter was still a sound, the cloud was in the sky, 4G was a parking space, linked in a prison, apps were things you filled out to get into Stanford University, big data was a rap star, and Skype for most of us was a typo. None of those things existed, but they're ubiquitous in our lives. We've gone from something old to something new, and you ain't seen nothing yet. You read the second machine age and what Andrew's writing about, the combinatorial nature of technology now, the big marriage of artificial intelligence and big data, what's happening with synthetic biology and genomics, what's happening with additive manufacturing. I have a winery. We just printed out a bottle that's never been done in the history of the wine business because we were able to print out the design of the new bottle. I've seen this firsthand, robotics, what's happening with the internet of everything as the internet moves to the physical world. And government, again, is still struggling with this old mindset and old procurement approach where we're still selling down our vision. And is it any wonder you don't vote? Because at the end of the day, 
however fabulous that guy or gal on the screen looks during those campaign commercials and how you believe in their promotion and change and how earnest they are, when they get into that system, as I said earlier, it does degenius you. The constraints of that office and that operating environment were self-evident when Uber went to Sacramento just a few weeks ago and went up against not just the taxi cab industry, but the insurance industry to continue to promote the share economy, provide opportunities not just for Travis and his team, but for Lyft and for Sidecar, the same contours of struggle with Brian and the folks at Airbnb. We are going from something old to something new. The white waters of change are everywhere, and government is still operating on a system in a world that was designed 150 years ago, a world clearly that no longer exists. Well, let me ask this question then, and, and I'll also devil's advocate and answer briefly. Uh, a, do we need government? Let's face it, there's enough innovation out there. We are all, the two of us, we're raising young kids who may not grow up to take a taxi cab. They certainly won't buy physical uh, media, um, no matter what government says. Uh, and, and my question to you is, okay, but you, know, you yourself came out very early and very strongly for issues like gay marriage, medicinal marijuana. You paid a price for it politically. Legalized marijuana, sorry. Uh, sorry, legalized marijuana. Um, tax um, regulate for adults, <laughs> for the record. See what happens when you get into politics? I know, I just want to, you know, I don't want someone tweeting something. <laughs> then, <yeah. laughs> but we do need, we do need, I would say, especially on the gay marriage issue, we do need brave politicians to get up there and say, this is what we need. And yeah, you paid a price for it. Yeah. The world caught up to you. But other than that, really, shouldn't we just let the techies take care of us and, <laughs> and make our lives better? Because maybe politicians really aren't. Yeah, I'm not a techno utopia. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and I'm not, you know, look, I, I'm scared to death of what's happened, what all you are creating because of our kids, Scott. I mean, there's a substantive reason why wages haven't increased in the last 20, 30 years. And it's not just hyper-financialization. It's not just Wall Street. It's not just tax policy. Technology is driving as much or more of it than anything else, hollowing out the center. It's no longer, you know, high-wage, middle-skilled jobs. They're gone. It's only high-wage, high-skill jobs, more specialized than ever. The entire educational system has to reconcile that. We're in a race against technology, and we are losing badly. As fine as we think we're doing, we're getting crushed, and we no longer, I serve on the UC Board of Regents, UC Board of Trustees, we don't have a monopoly on higher education for adults, quite the contrary. And our pedagogy, again, is 16th or 17th century pedagogy. It's a lecture model. And our parents could dump us in front of the TV, and we were used to getting broadcast. But my daughter, I mean, I kid you not, I thought she was a damn, I'd never seen anything like it. Two years old, she's somehow, she, my password's easy if you ever find my iPhone or iPad, it's 9876. And so she had figured it out at two, and I walked in one day, and there she is, and she's just on some Dora the Explorer app. And, and she's, I just like, I mean, co-create, she's engaged, and I'm looking over her shoulder, and I call my wife immediately. I said, oh my gosh. I went to Santa Clara University. I'm Catholic. I said, she's the one. <laughs> this is our prodigy. Until we took her to Ola Preschool a year later, and every single damn kid was doing the same thing. Burst my bubble. <laughs> uh, she's, she's wired literally and physically differently than I was. Uh, her brain's wired up. She can't sit in that classroom with rows of desks waiting for the school bell to ring and take the summer months off to toil the fields in Silicon Valley. Uh, she's not interested in someone coming up, the sage on the stage, and broadcasting and lecturing her so she could take notes, so she could be taught to the test. And by the way, as an employer, I've got close to 1,000 people that I employ in the state and my 17 businesses. I don't care how much you know, because Google knows more. Mm -hmm. I care about what you're going to do with what you know. I care about your critical thinking, your collaborative skills. I care about your communication skills, your creativity. I, I, I care about your ability to contextualize situations. Those are not things we're necessarily teaching, even in our finest universities. And so I, I'm very fearful about this. Back to my point, we're on a collision course of the future, and the white waters of change are immediate. 65% decline in taxi cab riders in a 12-month period in San Francisco. Not 6.5, 65. This is serious. And so for me, it is code red for government to wake up to this reality and reconcile it. But I still believe in government. I still believe in the words of Abraham Lincoln who said government should do only that which individuals cannot do better for themselves. 
And that is a big list of things that individuals cannot do better for themselves. Very good. We have a little bit of time left. Is there a step one to get to that point? Because clearly, I think you've hit on a problem. Government is doing so much and keeping a lot of these entrepreneurs from getting to the next stage, whether it's a better way to ride to work or the clubs or a better way to deliver a, a service. Uh, they're hitting that brick wall and, and often ignoring it. Ask Travis how much he, uh, you know, believes in government. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I believe his quote was, uh, we are running a campaign and the opponent is the taxi industry. Yeah. <laughs> well, Travis is particularly aggressive on all this. Uh, it, but you know what? I remember watching Bezos on that 60 Minutes when he came out with the drone and everyone said this fast. But there's a wonderful quote in there. He said, Amazon didn't happen to the book industry. The future happened to the book industry, which just gave me pause. I thought about that when I think about folks like Travis and these new platforms, this new app. I mean, you know, it wasn't, I remember, I'll never forget sitting there with a bunch of newspaper publishers way back when. Remember, you, some of you are too young to remember these days. Two thousand. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> your parents can tell you about this. Um, and newspapers were under assault because I remember sitting there in an audience, someone said to the publisher of the San Francisco Chronicle, said, hey, uh, I've got a, a question, Phil, the publisher. He says, what about this guy, uh, this guy Craig? He goes, Craig who? He goes, you know that guy with the list? <laughs> and someone said, Craig's list. And he goes, oh, I know Craig Moon. We got this. We got this. Well, you know, 70 major newspapers in North America have gone out of business. I'll never forget, it's good to be mayor. You're sitting there in San Francisco, and I think I was still supervisor, not mayor. It was, anyway, good to be a local elected. And I was invited down to the Moscone Center, front row seats, unbelievable, four plus thousand people. And a guy named Steve ran up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, iTunes. And it wasn't 20 months later that that big, beautiful, I was there for the grand opening, so proud, Richard Brantz was there, that beautiful Virgin Megastore. Didn't know what hit them, they were out of business. You know, Travis coming along with this app, 65, like this. I mean, the old days, it's 10, 20, 30 years the contours have changed. Now we're talking months. And government, again, still has inflexible rulemaking. We're still designing systems that are built, quote unquote, to last, not designed to change. We are not capable in this world that is mobile, local, social, cloud, crowd. We're still operating a 20th century operating system that's opaque, it's not transparent, it's not open, it's certainly not collaborative, we're not designing our systems for participation. Again, your voice tends to create some problems, change.gov, it's not my priority. And so this is, this is what we have to navigate. Now, I, I, in, I, don't, well, I didn't come here to promote my damn book, but we lay out specific strategies and details of how to solve this. Because uh, I don't want to just talk about who's to blame. I want to focus on what to do. And one of the biggest is this open data movement. To make data liquid, to make data machine readable and downloadable, open APIs. Uh, and San Francisco really led on this. The Obama administration's done a very good job. The state of California is embarrassingly behind. It's a point of friction with the governor and I. Uh, but cities are taking responsibility to start providing this data in a meaningful way. And I know we're almost out of time, but let me give you one specific example of why this is profound. Cost to the taxpayer is nothing. Cultural. Technological, sure, you've got to standardize the data, but cultural mindset of making this information real and available and visible. It started in the 1980s, and I'll just give you a, pause, just give you a point to pause and think about this. Ronald Reagan, of all people, was the godfather of the open data movement from a government perspective. In the 1980s, he decided to put GPS, or rather satellite data, excuse me, uh, and make it available to the public to mash up. It was used to be in the hands and the vaults of NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. This happened after the Soviets shot down an airplane and we didn't have the GPS connected. It was in response to the Cold War, he really did it. But he made that available. Since he did that, not only tens of billions of dollars of wealth creation, millions and millions of jobs have been created without $1 subsidy or $1 tax investment. Because we simply made that data available. It's why you have GPS. It's why your smartphones, smartphones know where the hell you are. It's why you have the weather channel. It's why you are able to know if it's gonna be beautiful here next week, too hot, too cold. It's been profound. What else exists in the vaults of government? What else exists at your local department of building inspection, at your recreation and parks department? What exists in the old redevelopment agency um, closets? 
what exists that we can make available so all of you in this room can form connections that folks like me are incapable of seeing and creating solutions to problems we don't even know exist. Medical records, maybe. Medical records. Government as a platform. Big on what? Small on how. Enliven your capacity to engage in a two-way conversations. Collaborative government, participatory government, open government, transparent government, build trust, engage individuals to solve problems for themselves as we address these larger societal challenges. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Newsom. Everybody, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Thanks, guys, for having me. The book is Citizenville, and uh, thanks for giving us some time.